Today's with the friends and family bidding. It's you know, so Stephen's in their office in uh, Santa Monica, Veneta Pro, and uh, he also runs one of the, the top tier blockchain events here. Yeah, a few events, you can maybe tell us about that as well. But we're going to see Veneta Pro today. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Stephen, the, what, what Mariana is referring to, we actually do the Beverly Hills blockchain events, and we we're doing it monthly pretty consistently. It's sort of fluttered around. I think we have the next one coming up on Tuesday. So those have been good. Uh, the group's about probably 1,600, and we were averaging 80, 90, 100 people showing up. So it, it was good. We're actually just doing a breakdown on the uh, makeup of the group, how many people were beginners, experts, intermediates, investors, things along that line. So pretty simple. Also on the LA token thing, we learned from that because we talked to him. It's actually La Token, but even the guys who work here think it's LA Token, and we were concerned because you can't do something out of LA. So they're actually international, and it's La Token for anybody that wants to do it. So with that, I'm going to jump in. My name is Steven Me Company. We have this called Mineta Pro. Some of you may have heard of it. I'm going to fly through things pretty quickly. Mineta Pro, quite simply, is a B2B exchange for what's called corporate barter. And not everybody's familiar with what that is. I don't like a lot of slides with big, heavy text on it, but this one just basically says large companies trade assets with other companies. So what we built a private closed loop transaction platform for large companies, and it goes by a bunch of different names, corporate good, intercompany trading, things along that line. And what it means is a company like Ford might have inventory through the years. And they'll trade with different companies. They'll trade with Burst for shipping or IBM for computers. They'll trade for hotels, airlines. Any of you ever seen a commercial at Super Bowl for a Ford truck? A lot of that's traded. Media companies trade a lot with barter and inventory. So these big companies are doing these large transactions. And what we basically built is something that affects 72% of the Fortune 500 companies and the average trade within this marketplace is a little over a million dollars. So it's a big market, but when you say, well, I've never heard of it, how big is it? Right? Investors like to say, is it a big market? It's a $17 trillion existing market worldwide. Massive market. But again, these are big companies doing lots of trades. And we joke, we could be bigger than Amazon. Have any of you ever met with investors say, oh, I missed out on Amazon? We, we get it all the time. I joke, I say, we can be bigger than Amazon, and people always go, well, how are you going to compete? I didn't say compete. So we've got a comparison here. Amazon, to me, I like doing simplified things. Amazon, in a nutshell, to the $20 trillion space of what's called retail commerce that is primarily business to consumer, the average transaction is $82, their total revenue is $220 billion, and they have a trillion dollar market cap. That is Amazon, very simply. Mineta Pro is going after a $17 trillion market. It's business to business. The average sale is $1.5 million. And I ask myself, how can we get to $200 million in revenue to be similar? We're not competitive, just in terms of market size. And we've targeted about 10 companies we're in discussions with that already do trades and transactions that total what it took Amazon 18 years to get to. Just a different market. And we also differentiated, John, you may love this one, because the difference between enterprise and, and consumer and things like that. So up here, a lot of people don't understand. To us, barter is small business. Local auto mechanic, printer, restaurant, that small business is out there. They may be a part of a local barter club. They're probably using QuickBooks and they're shopping on Amazon. Corporate trade doesn't work that way. These are B2B companies, primarily global multinationals, there are a few offline barter companies, but these huge companies use accounting systems like SAP and Oracle. QuickBooks, SAP, both accounting systems, they have a completely different market and functionality. And we want to be a marketplace in the B2B space, not primarily business to consumer. What's the current process? A lot of people don't realize this is manual. If a company wants to trade, they've got to call their buddy Mark and say, hey Mark, I'll give you some computers for a bunch of Guardian Circle to protect my employees. And he and I have to negotiate. What's the trade? What's the transaction? How do we track it? How's it reported? How's our inventory updated? And every time we have to repeat that and find more and more and more trading partners. And that's the challenge. So you might say, well, why don't companies just sell for cash? Here's a quick, easy example. If you're a CFO, all of you put your finance hat on, 
you're at Ford, you've got some cars left at the end of the year, a million dollars worth of inventory, your option is discount at 20%. Put them on sale. Everybody seen the sale of Ford? So now we're down 20% on our value. We sell them, we still pay taxes on the cars we sold, minus 20%, and we hurt our new channel of people who might have bought that inventory. Alternative, call your buddy over at Lenovo, say, hey, I'll give you a million dollars worth of cars, you give me a million dollars worth of computers, we'll call it even. This accomplishes some very interesting financial things. One, higher return. Both companies are trading at full value. They're not discounting the models to each other. That's why media guys love it. Instead of 10 cent remnant inventory, they're trading at full value. Two, it protects cash flow. If you can acquire a million dollars worth of computers without spending cash, that money stays on your balance sheet. It stays in your books. And three, under some IRS rules and regulations, is what's called a 1099B. It's potentially a tax-free transaction. So you can accomplish a million dollar trade, save cash, not pay taxes. But it's so complicated. What do we build? A better solution called Monetro. How many people like money? This is a quick little shift of history. I like history. Yeah, everybody does. When the world started out, it was barter. I've got chickens, you've got milk, let's trade. If you want chickens and I don't want milk or a whole cow, we have a problem just called portability. Money existed and was created for portability. The first forms of portable commerce ever were the Mineta seashells. The word money comes from the word Mineta. This is currency. This is what moved and evolved civilization forward. All the currency stuff we're seeing right now, all of these things, even the, the Facebook coins, this is all just about creating portability. What we did is created our own portability. We created something called a G-Buck. It stands for a general business usage credit. We could call it a global business currency. We could call it electronic currency. The minute you call this electronic currency, we get conflated off in the world of blockchain. And don't get me wrong, I love blockchain. I'm gonna show you how we use it. But what we built better, and here's what I mean by better. g box for us stands for a general business usage credit. A buck equals a dollar. Everybody in the world knows their currency to the buck, to the US dollar. What we build is not a blockchain credit, it's an internal ledger credit. What that means is we have immediate financial settlement, no volatility, and the credit stays within the system. Very simply, if any one of you sold a thousand dollar computer in Amazon, and Amazon gave you a store credit, that's not a blockchain credit, it's not a token. You didn't tokenize it, it can't be traded, it can't be stolen. It's a credit you can only spend in Amazon. The trick is not the credit. The goal is, is there anything in there you wanna spend it on? We built a media financial settlement inside a closed system. So what we've created is portability. Now a company like Ford can potentially trade cars, get a G-Buck or a business usage credit and create what's called multi-party trading sell an asset, receive credits. Now that you've sold the cars, you get a credit and you can turn around and use it to buy other assets, tires, batteries, parts, shipping. These ecosystems already exist. We're just creating portability within a closed marketplace. And we do use blockchain. And I love this. People go, are you a blockchain company? And I look at them and go, I don't understand. Are you an internet company? Take some a minute to think. Are any of you guys an internet company? That doesn't make any sense. The internet is a tool that enables what we're doing. To me, blockchain is a tool that enables what we're doing. We're a marketplace, but we do use blockchain for two very specific things. If you get an invoice, have any of you guys shop on Amazon? Have you ever clicked on your order history? Order history doesn't do much. If you bought things for business and personal, it's hard to separate out. It's hard to turn things into accounting. That invoice is static. If you're a large organization, that is a problem. We've split our invoice in two parts. One, half of our invoice is now written to IBM. We're the third partner on their hyperfabric in the enterprise side. We're writing our technology, technically not blockchain, it's distributed ledger, it's DLT. It's what's called a shadow ledger. But part of our solution, we don't go to companies and sell them blockchain. We've integrated it into what we're doing. So for a company, we say, you transfer assets out, your fixed asset module, we can automatically integrate into SAP and Oracle. So when that company transfers a million dollars worth of cars, their inventory system is updated and that keeps them in compliance, which is a big problem for these companies. 
So that's half of it, but here's the deal. If any of you know this, if I transfer a million dollars worth of cars, I have another problem, which means I need to prove that car went somewhere. You can't just remove inventory and not prove who you transferred it to. We're writing the top half of our invoice to a DocuSign blockchain smart contract only because not we want you know, transactions and all that. This is just a contract to prove an audit trail to show that that asset went to that third party. So we're solving problems by taking our invoice to an accounting module through IBM that communicates with these existing enterprises systems and then proven an audit trail and it's built into our solution seamlessly. Companies don't even touch blockchain. They don't need to know what it is. That's my joke. I don't know how blockchain works. I know how it works for you. How it works for our clients is it's gonna update inventory and give them an audit trail. And that's really what we built. So three main problems. We do an automation of trade, inventory update, and compliance proof of ownership. But the undercarriage is really the blockchain side. The top level is the marketplace. Finishing up, bunch of white papers proving this. IBM's got one showing these huge companies, multinational companies, intercompany trading, too many moving parts, lack of transparency. Tons of white paper validating the problem that we built a solution for. And the reason for that management, real quick, my background, a lot of you guys know me, I've started 11 companies. My, my new positioning, I'm now officially called the bullseye guy. I read hundreds of books. I've developed a system of reading hundreds of books. I trained 8,000 people when I was 22 and developed a system called a bullseye belief system. And I used that to create my first company in 96, took it public in 99, it was worth a billion dollars. And then it wasn't. Any of you that were through the crash of 99, 2000? Yeah, we were there. Um, but basically we built a lot of things, but my, my position is I'm a startup CEO. These are my companies. I get the momentum and then I bring in the execution CEO. The execution guy we just brought in, Paul Horowitz, 18 years PwC, global consultant of the year, ran technology and outsourcing, left and ran Deloitte and Touche's FinTech program at a billion five. PwC recruited him back. He built the outsourcing to 500 million in revenue and 3,500 people in just under three years. We brought him in to execute into the enterprise because what we built is an enterprise solution. Bullseye go to market strategy, last couple things. We target people very specifically. This is sort of what we learned. We looked at the 2,000 largest companies in the world based on assets, not sales, revenue, employees, assets, things you own. Broke it down to the top 10 industries that have the highest propensity of trading. Food and drink, automotive, airlines, manufacturing. 987 from there we found 88 articles with evidence of the company's trading. Those articles gave us two things. One, the companies and the type of trade, but two, the names of the person that executed that trade. From there, 47 we have direct relationships with. We picked our top 10. These top 10 do over 200 billion in existing trade. We're in discussions with, I think, eight of the top 10 right now. So it's an enterprise sale. It takes longer, but if you get a couple, you move up very quickly. Value proposition, something I created called ELT, equals V efficiency is the platform. Liquidity, these companies already trade with each other. We're not bringing them a marketplace. They already have existing trusted relationships. We got in a little tip with IBM. IBM thought the value of the trust was blockchain. The value of the trust for what we're doing is the network. These companies already trade with each other and know each other. Blockchain's just the education component. So that's the value. Revenue model, it's enterprise software. Onboarding fee, monthly hosting, a percentage of total revenue after some, some fixed targets. Um, we believe we've got multiple exit opportunities, everything from SAP and Oracle into Amazon, the whole way out. Salesforce ready. When I talk enterprise, Amazon's a single user sign on. One of the things we mean by enterprise is it's hierarchy. Divisions, departments, rights, user authorities, screenshots, it's easy to enter the uh, assets in. The author raised four and a half million. Systems are ready to go. We're actually doing a $10 million equity round. But then we created it not up here because we're doing a lot with corporate ventures. So we sanitized the slide, but this is a little different group. We created something different called a liquidity token. And a lot of people have heard me talk about that. Anybody that invests gets equity. Current round's 50 cents. And then we give a shadow liquidity token 
that we do as a writer. It's an option. We do not deliver a token to you. We don't airdrop it. You don't own it. You have no liability. You have not taken possession, and you have not invested in an ICO. You own the option at 50 cents to take possession at some point in the future. It's almost like a called warrant. And what we're doing is, I believe October, we're going to do an international token round out of Bitrix with Malta. We helped them get into Malta. So we have four exchanges we're getting pre-approved on. We're going to launch a token round and probably raise $30 million. So here's the way this works. Any of you done institutional investing before? This is what's called a Series A. So the 4.5 was our friends and family in our private round, 17 investors. The 10 million is a Series A. Traditional equity valuations, we can talk to you all of that. Historically, what we would have to do is go do a 20 or $30 million Series B, take all this time, all the roadshow, all the dilution, more overhang, more board members. We're gonna do a $30 million round through International. That is non-dilutive equity back into the company because it's a pure token, not security. They are separate. So for the investor, it's not an either or or convertibles, it's a both. That investor, what we're telling them is just like a warrant. Before you execute a warrant, you set up your tax strategy. We're telling companies if you've invested, when you want that warrant, set up a special purpose vehicle. Set up an SPV in Cayman, Bahamas, Singapore, wherever the jurisdiction is, before you execute, take possession of the token, liquidate out through our offering. It's like a direct public offering. You still have your equity. And if we're successful, that 20 or $30 million is a non-dilutive Series B to build a company. So we think we have a really unique investment strategy. If the token stuff works great, if not, they still have equity. So we separated them out. Status, company's ready to go. We're in discussions with a, a lot of these companies. The IBM deal is done. UPS is in play, Home Depot's in play. I can't even remember, Shaker's got a list of them, but experience management team, that's Veneta Pro, thank you very much. Uh, questions? Yeah, Gene. Well, as I understand it, let's, let's say GM's got a lot of cars and they want to trade for some computers or some computer systems, they want to trade for some software. Right. Where, how does that exact transaction take place? I mean, you know, a car is in a parking lot somewhere, and they go, and they, the guy, they meet in, at a bridge at midnight. I mean, how does that work? Currently, it's it's all it's offline. So when these what Gene's question was, if GM, for instance, wants to trade with somebody for computers, where does it exist? That again is why I showed that slide. Our software is set up with divisions, departments. For something like GM, it's really locations. So one location might have those assets. It's an e-commerce interface. I, again, I flew through the screens, but that location would list the assets they have, list the cars, set the price. If they sold them to a third party, negotiations are, are done in the system. They would figure out shipping. That's why we're in discussions with UPS and DHL. Do you do, do, you do that to actually, actually verify that exchange? No, what we do, it's kind of like an Amazon. And again, these are trusted partners. So we our validation metrics is a little lower. We're providing a platform and a market for these companies to trade with each other, but we're targeting the, the Fortune you know, 2000 that already know each other. But the validation in the blockchain, the smart contract, actually proves the asset was transferred and received. What we're really trying to do is we're trying to plug Tradewinds in, which is the IBM solution with Maersk and all the invoicing. That's why we're in discussions with IBM. I just want to plug their logistic invoicing solution into what we're doing. And but currently, it's just a manual. We make money from the seller. If you try and do buyer-seller transactions, it gets tough. And also for enterprise, you can't charge a per transaction fee. You could, but the budgets aren't set up at all these different divisions. So we're taking a 1% off the total volume at corporate after the first five or 10 million. So we could just build the companies quarterly off total transaction volume and not have to build per transaction because they can't figure out budget allocation. Have you actually done a transaction? Well, the software is built, all the testing's done. We've got four companies in, you know, looking at the testing and figuring out how to start, but nothing's gone live yet. It's still pre-revenue. Products are done. Yeah, John. So I can attest to the value of this because I actually partnered with Bullfight today. The Yamaha was a big customer of Bullfight, and they basically trade me toys. Yeah. And so I got jet skis and stereos. There you go. And, and 
So companies do this, large and small. Yeah. And, 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 and it's uh, they don't have the systems for it. So I, I, I take what you're doing. Yeah, and, and that's a great point. John was saying that he traded Goldmine for Yamaha for sports stuff, but. After a while, Yamaha may want two or three or four million dollars in licenses, and there's only so many jet skis and snowmobiles. Our system would have allowed you to do that at full value, yeah. set your limits of how much you wanted to trade, You're right. earn because those credits, that's, and then that's the biggest value, right? Because then you get a currency, and then you can go someplace else with it. Correct, and we call it a credit. It's technically a currency, yes. but yes, it's an internal currency or credit that you could then use to offset your marketing, your ad spend, your travel. So it creates that portability, but these companies are doing it. We just built it, and we actually, not to get off the rails, we float the, the price within the system, which is kind of cool. Anybody that's done international, if I call Gene and want to buy a container of bananas today out of Brazil, he goes real to the dollar, 8.5, it's a million dollars. If I call him on Monday, the price changed because of the currency. Our system automatically pings the currency to the dollar and adjusts the price in real time when somebody looks at it. So we eliminate global fluctuation. We're now a company can sell into China, not care what the RMB is, get a credit, repatriate, go buy something out of Zimbabwe and not care about the, the Zimbabwe dollar. How it's real time are you trading? The trades are instantaneous. So again, that's why I didn't build this on, on blockchain internally, because in, any of you guys ever move money within a bank account from your own account? How long does it take for you to move money within your own bank? It's, it's instant because it's technically a ledger credit. So that's why the, our credit's internal. It's instantaneous. We were stress tested on, on a government solution for this at 380,000 concurrent transactions. And concurrent for us is not what people are in searching around. The, the database is split. It's 365,000, I think it was the number, hit buy. Because when they hit buy, that's when our system has to go through the checks and balances of accounts. So yeah, it's pretty much immediate financial settlement. Invoices are written and then the the integration, the companies can decide if and when they want to update their modules. So we don't have to update the modules in real time. It's not a, a, a latency transaction issue. It's can I sell something, get credits, they instantly show on my account, can I go buy something else? Anything else? Yeah, sorry. Uh, how do you uh, hedge the credit risk? So, for example, uh, you know, in that case, uh, Yamaha poses you the policy test keys, but Yamaha gets to send it I don't, so the question was how do you hedge the credit risk? We don't, we're the marketplace. So what we actually do is we validate the companies coming on. It's not a blind consumer sign up like an, an eBay or an Amazon. So all the companies that come on, like if John came on with Goldmine, we would credit score him. We would look at his revenue, approve him for up to 10% of that in the system to trade, which means he cannot trade and accumulate internal credits over the limits we set for him. And then he can set public limits that may be lower. And then again, the, the, the goal is going after companies that already trade with each other. So that validation risk is lower, but we don't carry the risk because we don't give them credits until they sell something. So you price for the credit to someone else. The credit risk goes with the credit. The only true credit risk in there is is there something else in the market you want to spend it on? As long as you sold something and, and received the credit. The, the risk is, and I joke, again, this is on camera, so I have to be careful. Anybody that invested in our token round at 10 cents, one of our models is they can return the token to us and we'll give them a dollar's credit in the system. I guarantee any investor a 900% rate of return. My attorney said it. I guarantee that, hold on, hold on, man. I guarantee you a 900% rate of return if you return a 10 cent token and I give you a dollar. I can't guarantee there's anything in the market you want to spend it on. It's like a $25 restaurant gift card that converts to $100, only has value if the restaurant gets built. Our, our focus is on building the marketplace. The, the, the credit token stuff takes care of itself. We believe. Yeah, that's uh, I just got a question on, what's going on, man? Uh, privacy, data, and security. Yeah. So how are you securing the data and at any time, who has access to see the data internally and externally, and have you been stress test for possible breaches? Yeah, so some of it was stress tested because we built a bank rate because we actually thought we were gonna treat it as a global currency. But the other side of it is we don't hold, we're not doing the financial transactions. So we don't integrate into their financial modules. A lot of the actual sensitive security things that are dealt around payment doesn't occur in ours. If you sell something, all you're listing is, is a car 
you're receiving credits that can only be spent in the system. So a lot of our security things are, are not as relevant because we're not doing payment, we're not doing financial, we're not integrated into any systems other than just we're moving an asset out of that inventory module. All right, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for many applications of this, like barter advertising on TV. How are you feeling? Good. Mark Jeffrey just came back from Austin, Texas. I did. 